Good evening. I'm Joe Nye, Dean of the Kennedy School, and I am here to introduce Secretary of Defense William Perry. But before we do that and hear Secretary of Defense Perry's speech, we wanted to begin the evening with an honor for a Kennedy School graduate. Joe Krusel, who was Master of Public Administration in 1969, received his PhD at the Government Department in 1975, and was a fellow of the Program in Science and International Affairs, which subsequently became our Center for Science and International Affairs. And we're lucky or fortunate to have with us tonight in the audience uh, Gail Krusel. I should say that on August 9th, 1995, uh, we had one of the worst days of my life and one of the worst days for the Defense Department. Uh, that Saturday, by irony, faxes had gone out that I was going to be the new dean of the Kennedy School and announcing that I would be leaving my position as Assistant Secretary for International Security Affairs. And on Monday, I was supposed to announce that to all the people that uh, I was working with in the Pentagon in international security affairs. And the previous Wednesday, I had been on the telephone to Joe Krusel, my very close friend and deputy for European affairs. He was in Belgrade, where he was devoting his efforts to the try attempts to bring peace to Bosnia. And I said to him, Joe, I'm going to be making this announcement the next Monday. And I should tell you something, which is a confidence, but I know you'll respect it, which is that I expect that you will be my successor as Assistant Secretary. I've talked with Secretary Perry about it, and while no decision has been made, I think everyone agrees that you're the right person for this job. And we talked about how he would be coming back, and we'd talk it over, and it would be early the next week. Instead of that, on that Saturday of August 19th, we got the terrible news of the accident in Sarajevo in which Joe Krusel lost his life. And instead of that, the following Monday was not a day of celebration, but a day of mourning in which I had to announce to my and Joe colleagues this terrible loss. And we still mourn him to this day. He was a remarkable man, creative, witty, dedicated, a true public servant, somebody who stands for everything that the Kennedy School should stand for. He gave his life for his country and for the search for peace in Bosnia. And it seemed only fitting that when Secretary Perry, also a close friend, was here for his speech, that we should pause and remember Joe Krusel. Nope. Later tonight, I will be giving a talk about the legacy of George Marshall and our efforts at the Department of Defense to complete Marshall's vision for Europe. No one was more central to this effort than Joe Krusel. As head of our Office for European and NATO Affairs, Joe led the way in revamping Europe's security relationships in the wake of the Cold War. He reinvigorated our ties with Western Europe. And as a primary architect for the Partnership for Peace, he reached out a hand of friendship to Eastern and Central Europe and the former Soviet republics. In so doing, Joe helped to provide the entire region with a newfound sense of security and stability. Indeed, it may be said that Joe Krusel was America's partner for peace. When Joe joined our team, he said that one of his major goals was to see peace in the former Yugoslavia. And he became so valuable to this effort that the President appointed him to a special American negotiating team. Ultimately, he gave his life in that struggle. In my travels to Bosnia since last August, I have seen just how much danger Joe faced when he traveled there. I have seen how important it was that he made that trip. The devastation even today in Bosnia 
is unspeakably saddening. But the hope for peace among all of the parties is truly uplifting. And it was Joe who first planted this hope. And it is Joe's work that is bearing the fruit of peace that we are seeing unfold today. In his poem, Ulysses, Tennyson captured the spirit and the legacy of Joe Crusoe when he wrote, I am part of all that I have met. All times I have enjoyed greatly and have suffered greatly with those that loved me. I have followed knowledge like a sinking star. Beyond the utmost bound of human thought, but some work of noble note may yet be done. Come, my friends, it is not too late to seek a newer world. It is not too late to seek a newer world. May this plaque inspire all who study at the Kennedy School to continue to seek the newer world that Joe Crusoe sought and to hold in our minds and in our hearts the memory of this great American who, better than anyone I know, understood Elie Wiesel's profound insight that peace is not God's gift to his creatures. Peace is our gift to each other. I'd like to ask Gail Cruzel if she'll join us to unveil this plaque. I will read the citation that's on the plaque. Joe Krusel spent his professional life in the field of national security affairs not only as a practitioner but also as an academic. After finishing his Ph.D. from Harvard in 1975, Joe taught at both Harvard and Duke. He then became director of the Program on International Security and Military Affairs at the Mershon Center at Ohio State University. Selected by students at both Duke and Ohio State as an outstanding teacher, Joe inspired and encouraged students who were searching for their personal and professional paths in life. While at Ohio State, Joe continued to be a valuable contributor in Washington, serving as a consultant to the State Department, USAID, the Department of Defense and Congress, as well as a member of Senator Kennedy's staff. Joe returned to Washington in 1993 as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for European and NATO policy. During his first year in office, he helped develop the Partnership for Peace initiative, which brought greater stability to Europe. He was deeply involved in efforts to bring peace into Bosnia and the Balkans. While in Bosnia to help broker peace for the region, Joe was killed outside Sarajevo on August 19, 1995. Joe Krusel is remembered by his friends and colleagues for his humor, his energy, and his brilliance. His life is marked by the compassion he showed to others and his dedication to the pursuit of peace. As President Clinton said at the memorial service, the world is a more secure place because of Joe's dedication. May God bless Joe Krusel, for he was a peacemaker. This plaque will hang in the library of the Kennedy School to inspire other students. In addition to that, the Kennedy School Center for Science and International Affairs, where Joe was a fellow, will each year have a named fellowship in Joe Krusel's honor. And director of the center, Graham Allison, has announced that today as well. So we are grateful for you, Gail, for coming and joining us, and Mr. Secretary, and we will always remember Joe Krusel. Thank you. It's now my privilege to introduce uh, William J. Perry, Secretary of Defense. In selecting Mr. Perry as Defense Secretary, President Clinton chose a man with broad experience in government, academia, and high-tech industry. And in a rare display of unanimity, 
the Senate agreed that this was the right choice by a vote of 97 to nothing on February 3, 1994. Bill Perry was born in Vandegrift, Pennsylvania, received his BS and MS from Stanford University and his PhD from Penn State, all in mathematics. In 1964, he helped to found ESL and maker of Pentagon devices and electronics. And in 1977, he joined the Carter administration as Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, where among other things, he helped to pioneer the work which later became the stealth bomber. During his first tour, after his first tour of duty in Washington, uh, Mr. Perry returned to Silicon Valley, where he helped build the research department of Hambrick and Quest, and then founded another company, Technology Strategies and Alliances. And in 1991, he became the co-director of the Center for International Security and Arms Control at Stanford, where he also became a professor of engineering. I just say that there, in my book, at least two important marks of a good man. One is his wife, and Lee Perry, who is accompanying him here this evening and has been with him through all this, is a wonderful tribute to all of us. Uh, she has been a person who's made the Pentagon a great place to be, as well as every other place she's been. And the other mark of a good man is the opinion of those who work for him, who see him up close. And everyone I know who has ever worked for Bill Perry has a feeling of great warmth and affection for it. And that's not true about everyone in Washington. I should say that Bill Perry is not only a good man, he's also a great Secretary of Defense. And it's a privilege to welcome him this evening to the Kennedy School. Bill. In a famous 1837 lecture right here at Harvard, Ralph Waldo Emerson asked his audience, if there is any period one would desire to be born in, is it not the age of revolution? When the old and the new stand side by side, when the energies of all men are searched by fear and by hope, when the historic glories of the old can be compensated by the rich possibilities of the new. Like Emerson, we too live in an age of revolution, a revolution in politics with the ending of the Cold War, in economics with the dramatic growth of global trade, and in technology with the continuing explosion of information systems. Today, we are living Emerson's desire in a revolutionary era of truly rich possibilities, an era where our energies are indeed searched by fear and by hope. Our hope is symbolized by the success of democracy around the globe, by the growth of new global trade relationships, by the expansion of global communications and by the explosion of information. Indeed, in this revolutionary era, the term closed society is rapidly becoming obsolete. Even those states that still desire isolation find it increasingly difficult to achieve, indeed impossible to achieve if they want to reap the benefits of the global economy. As China discovered during the Tiananmen Square crackdown, when they could not control the fax machines and the modems. But along with this hope, our energies in this revolutionary era are also searched by fear. Fear of the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, fear of ethnic hatreds ripping asunder existing states, fear of terrorism by extremist groups, and fear of aggression by rogue nations freed from the constraints of their former Cold War alliances. For many, this revolutionary new era has meant a decreased sense of personal safety, symbolized by pictures of the bodies being carried from the Federal Building in Oklahoma, or of the gassed passengers rushing from a Tokyo subway. This stark contrast between our hopes and our fears 
make clear that this revolutionary new era is characterized by humankind's increased capacity for good and for evil. It also makes clear that in addition to revolutions in politics, economics, and technology, there must also be a revolution in our security strategy. The security of the United States continues to require us to maintain strong military forces to deter and, if necessary, to defeat those who threaten our vital national security interests. And we do. But today, the United States also has a unique historical opportunity. It is the opportunity to prevent the conditions of conflict and create the conditions for peace. Tonight, I want to talk to you about how our security policy takes advantage of that opportunity by establishing preventive defense as the first line of defense of America. With deterrence, the second line of defense, and with military conflict, the third and the last line of defense. Preventive defense may be thought of as analogous to preventive medicine. Preventive medicine creates the conditions which support health, making disease less likely and surgery unnecessary. Preventive defense creates the conditions which support peace, making war less likely and deterrence unnecessary. Twice before in this century, America has had similar opportunities to prevent the conditions for conflict. After World War I, the United States had the opportunity to help prevent conflict by joining the League of Nations and engaging in the world. Instead, we chose to isolate ourselves from the world. That strategy of isolationism, coupled with the European strategy of reparations and revenge, utterly failed to prevent the conditions for future conflict. Indeed, it helped create them. And over 300,000 Americans paid with their lives in the Second World War. After World War II, America was determined to learn from that costly lesson. And this time, we chose the path of engagement. We sought to prevent conflict from recurring through our engagement in the United Nations, and by our leadership as we promoted a post-war program of reconciliation and reconstruction in sharp contrast to the revenge and reparation practiced after World War I. Our most dramatic national effort to prevent future conflict was announced at Harvard's 1947 commencement by George C. Marshall, and it came to be called the Marshall Plan. Marshall acted at a pivotal moment in this century. Like Emerson, Marshall saw America in a world standing between two eras, a period Marshall described as be between a war that is over and a peace that is not yet secure. And at this pivotal moment, Marshall set forth a strategy of preventive defense. The soldier in Marshall wanted desperately to prevent war from recurring. The statesman in Marshall found a way. His vision was of a Europe, from the Atlantic to the Urals, united in peace, freedom, and democracy. His tool for realizing this vision was a plan for rebuilding a European continent that had been physically, economically, and spiritually shattered by war. The Marshall Plan rested on three premises, that what happens in Europe affects America, that economic restructuring in Europe was critical to preventing another war, and that this economic reconstruction would not happen without American leadership. Acting on these premises, Marshall and his generation rebuilt Europe. They led America to assume the mantle of world leadership. And their preventive defense program, where applied, was successful in creating the conditions of peace and stability. In the end, however, 
Marshall's vision was only half realized because Joseph Stalin slammed the door on Marshall's offer of assistance. And within a matter of years, the world was divided into two armed camps. And deterrence, not prevention, became the overarching security strategy of the Cold War. But while geopolitics doomed Marshall's efforts at preventive security for all of Europe, the technology of nuclear weapons made global war too terrible to contemplate. And so deterrence worked. Now, after more than 40 dangerous years of the nuclear balance of terror, the Cold War is over. Today, we are at another pivotal moment of history, a point between two centuries, a point between a Cold War is over and a peace that is not yet secure. Today, the world does not need another Marshall Plan but to ensure that it is our hopes and not our fears that will be realized, we do need to build on Marshall's core belief. His core belief that the United States must remain a global power and that our best security policy is one that prevents conflict. Just as the Marshall Plan was based on a set of premises, so today our program of preventive defense rests on its own set of premises. First, that fewer weapons of mass destruction in fewer hands makes America and the world safer. Second, that more democracy in more nations means less chance of conflict around the world. And third, that defense establishments have an important role to play in building democracy, trust, and understanding in and among nations. From these premises follows the conclusion that for the post-Cold War World War to be one of peace and not of conflict, then America must lead the world in preventing the conditions for conflict and in creating the conditions for peace. In short, we must lead with a policy of preventive defense. And so we have created an innovative set of programs in the Defense Department to do just that, some of them national, some of them international. They include the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program to reduce the nuclear weapon complex of the former Soviet Union, the Counter Proliferation Program to deal with the threat of the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, the Framework Agreement to eliminate the nuclear weapon program of North Korea, the Partnership for Peace to begin the integration of 27 nations of Eastern and Central Europe and Central Asia into the European security structure. Tonight, I will describe the progress in these programs and how they are, in fact, creating conditions which prevent conflict. Nowhere is preventive defense more important than encountering the spread of nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons. During the Cold War, the world lived with the nightmare prospect of a global nuclear holocaust, and the United States and the Soviet Union relied on deterrence, a balance of terror known as Mutual Assured Destruction, or MAD. Today, the threat of global nuclear holocaust is vastly reduced, but we face the new danger that weapons of mass destruction will fall into the hands of terrorists or rogue nations. The threat of retaliation may not matter much to a terrorist or a rogue nation, so deterrence may not work with them. That is, this new class of undeterrables may be madder than mad. The aspiration of these rogue nations to obtain weapons of mass destruction is set against the backdrop of the disintegration of the former Soviet Union. This disintegration meant that instead of one nuclear empire, we were left with four new states, each with nuclear weapons on their soil, Russia, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, and Belarus. The depressed economies of these nations 
created a buyer's market for weapons of mass destruction, including the materials, infrastructure, and workforce. And the unsettled political conditions made it potentially harder to protect those weapons and material. So the increase in demand for nuclear weapons and the potential increase in supply of weapons, materials, and know-how have required us to augment our Cold War strategy of deterrence with a post-Cold War strategy of prevention. And the most effective way to prevent proliferation is to dismantle the arsenals that already exist. Fortunately, through our cooperative threat reduction program with Russia and the other nuclear states of the former Soviet Union, we have the dismantlement well started. Through a defense program originally created by Senator Sam Nunn and Senator Dick Lugar, we have helped Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and Kazakhstan dismantle thousands of nuclear warheads and destroy hundreds of missiles, bombers, and silos. Just this January, I personally detonated an SS-19 silo at Pervomysk. Pervomysk was the crown jewel of the former Soviet's ICBM complexes. At that site, they had 700 nuclear warheads all of them aimed at targets in the United States. And by the end of this month, that missile field will have been converted to a wheat field. By the end of the year, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, and Belarus will be entirely free of nuclear weapons. We are also using non-Lugar funds to help these nations safeguard and secure their weapons and materials to keep them out of the global marketplace. Under Project Sapphire, for example, we bought 600 kilograms of highly enriched uranium from Kazakhstan simply to ensure that it did not fall into the hands of nuclear smugglers. But preventing proliferation means more than just dismantling the Cold War nuclear arsenals. It also means leading the world in the right direction, as we did last year in gaining a consensus for the indefinite extension of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. It means working, working to strengthening the Biological Weapons Convention and ratifying the Chemical Weapons Convention. It means taking the lead in a range of international export controls to limit the flow of goods and technology that could be used to make weapons of mass destruction. Preventing proliferation also means leading the international community in imposing economic sanctions against those rogue nations with nuclear or chemical weapon aspirations, such as Iran and Libya. These sanctions have helped prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons, and they have significantly slowed Libya's efforts to put a chemical weapon production plant into operation. Sometimes preventing proliferation means, means employing coercive diplomacy, a combination of diplomacy and defense measures. In North Korea, for example, we use such a combination to stop that nation's nuclear weapons program. The diplomacy came from the threats used by the United States and other nations in the region to impose economic sanctions if North Korea did not stop their program. And the promise of assistance and the production of commercial power, if they did. The defense came from our simultaneous beefing up of our military forces in the region. The result is that today, while North Korea continues to pose a conventional military threat on the peninsula, it is not mounting a nuclear threat. All in all, the United States, since 1991, has been instrumental in eliminating or reversing nuclear weapon program in six states, Ukraine, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Iraq, North Korea, and South Africa. These efforts have made both America and the world safer, and the gains to our national security have been dramatic, direct, and tangible. Indeed, I can think of few more satisfying moments in my life than the day when I turned the key which blew up the missile silo at Pervomysk. But the story of preventive defense 
is not merely one of preventing threats from weapons of mass destruction. It is also the story of engaging military and defense establishments around the world to further the spread of democracy. I had a very interesting meeting with the uh, defense ministers of the states of the former Soviet Union that had nuclear weapons, Kazakhstan, Belarus, Ukraine, and they were about to give up the nuclear weapons. And one of the defense ministers said to me plaintively, nuclear weapons is what makes our country great. And I said, no, that's not right. Nuclear weapons make you powerful. But building a democracy in your country is what will make you great. And that is their aspiration, and that is what we are trying to help them achieve. To do this, we have to further the trust and understanding among nations. And here, the results may be less immediately tangible than eliminating the nuclear weapons, but they are no less significant. America has long understood that the spread of democracy to more nations is good for our national security. And it has been heartening this past decade to see so many nations around the world come to agree with us that democracy is the best system of government. But as the nations of the world attempt to act on this consensus, we are seeing that there are important steps between a worldwide consensus and a worldwide reality. Democracy is learned behavior. Many nations today have democracies that exist on paper, but in fact are extremely fragile. And elections are a necessary but an insufficient condition for a free society. It is also necessary to embed democratic values in the key institutions of the nation. And I believe that our Defense Department has a key role to play in this effort. In virtually every new democracy, in Russia, in the newly free nations of the former Soviet Union, in Central and Eastern Europe, in South America, in the Asian Tigers, the military represents a major force. In many cases, it is the most cohesive institution. And it often contains a large percentage of the educated elite, and it controls key resources. In short, it is an institution that can either support democracy or subvert it. And we must recognize that each society moving from totalitarianism to democracy will be tested at some point by a crisis. It could be an economic crisis, could be a backslide on human rights and freedoms, a border or ethnic dispute with a neighboring country. But when such a crisis occurs, we want the military to play a positive role in resolving the crisis, not a negative role by fanning the flames of the crisis or even using the crisis as a pretext for a military coup. In these new democracies, we can choose to ignore this important institution or we can try to exert a positive influence. We have chosen the latter. And believe me, we do have the ability to influence. Indeed, every military in the world looks to the U.S. Armed Forces as the model to be emulated. And that is a valuable bit of leverage, and we can put it to use creatively in our preventive defense strategy. In addition, if we can build trust and understanding between the militaries, of two neighboring nations, we build trust and understanding between the two nations themselves. Some have said that war is too important to be left solely to the generals. And I would say that peace is too important to be left solely to the politicians. In the effort to build trust and understanding, preventive defense uses a variety of tools, tools such as educating foreign officers at our military staff and command colleges, where they learn how to operate in a democratic society and how to operate under civilian control and with legislative oversight. Over 200 officers from the former Warsaw Pact countries are right now, right today, studying at U.S. military institutions. 
and another 60 are this very week about to complete a special course that we have set up at the Marshall Center in Germany. These officers are the future military leaders of their countries, and they are all coming together to learn how a military functions in democratic society. Another tool is sending out teams of American military officers and civilians to help nations build modern professional military establishments under strong civilian defense leadership. Since 1992, these teams have made thousands of contacts in over a dozen newly free nations. These contacts have led Hungary, for example, to enact new laws placing the Hungarian military under civilian democratic control. They have helped Romania develop a new code of conduct for their military forces based on the American military's uniform code of military justice. They have helped Lithuania, Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan to improve their training for non-commissioned officers. We also use such tools as joint training exercises in peacekeeping, disaster relief, and search and rescue operations. Last July, for example, we held a joint peacekeeping exercise in Louisiana involving the troops from 14 nations with whom we had never had security relations. And I stood on the reviewing stand in this summer, hot summer day in Louisiana and watched the 14 nations march by with their flags all blazing side by side. And there was Slovakia and Slovenia, Romania and Albania, Uzbekistan and Poland and Kazakhstan, and Lithuania and Albania, all of them there together. After the, after the opening ceremony, I went down and talked with the platoons from each of these countries and found out, first of all, how proud they were to be there in America, learning about how military functions a democracy and how much they were benefiting from the conversations they were having with their colleagues from other nations. Next month, I will meet in Lviv in Ukraine with the ministers of the defense from Ukraine, Russia, and Poland for the opening ceremonies of peacekeeping exercise, the first time those nations have ever joined together, this time on the soil of Ukraine, to conduct a joint exercise. Confidence-building measures are another important tool, particularly in building trust between countries. One of the most important confidence-building measures is developing openness about military budgets, plans, and policy, something we take for granted, but something which is entirely foreign to the tradition of the Eastern European countries. Openness, after all, is an unusual concept when it comes to defense. The art of war, after all, involves secrecy and surprise. But the art of peace involves exactly the opposite, openness and trust. And that's why when I travel to newly democratic states, I set an example to them by handing out copies of my annual report to Congress, which details our defense budgets, plans, and programs, and discuss with them how I deal with our Congress, how legislative oversight works, and how our budget process works. Sometimes it's hard for me to engender the necessary enthusiasm for this discussion, but I always try. These concepts seem elementary to you and to me, but to military officers and defense officials who grew up under totalitarianism, they are positively revolutionary. In Europe and Central Asia, these tools of preventive defense all come together in the NATO program that is known as the Partnership for Peace. And through the Partnership for Peace, NATO is reaching out to the nations of Eastern and Central Europe Russia and the newly independent states, and truly integrating them into the security architecture of Europe. Just as the Marshall Plan had an impact well beyond the economies of Western Europe, the Partnership for Peace is echoing beyond the security realm and partner nations into the political and economic realms. Partners are working to uphold democracy, tolerate diversity, respect the rights of minorities and the freedom of expression. They are working to build market economies. They are working to develop democratic control of the military forces, to be good neighbors, 
and to respect the sovereign rights of bordering countries. Those are all the conditions for being members of the Partnership for Peace. For those partner countries that are embracing Partnership for Peace as a path to NATO membership, these actions are a key to opening that door. For many of these nations, aspiration to NATO membership has become the rock on which all major political parties base their platforms. It is providing an overlapping consensus on a unifying goal, making compromise and reconciliation on other issues possible. To lock in the gains of reform, NATO must ensure that the ties that we are creating in the Partnership for Peace continue to deepen and that we actually proceed with a gradual and deliberate but the steady process of outreach and enlargement to the East. But ultimately, the Partnership for Peace is doing more than just building the basis for NATO enlargement. By forging networks of people and institutions working together to preserve freedom, promote democracy, and build free markets, the Partnership today is a catalyst for transforming Central and Eastern Europe, much as the Marshall Plan transformed Western Europe in the 50s. In short, the Partnership for Peace is not just defense by other means. It is also democracy by other means. It is helping prevent the realization of our fears for the post-Cold War era and taking us closer to realizing our hopes. One of these hopes is that Russia will participate in a positive way in the new security architecture of Europe. Russia has been a key part of the European security picture for over 300 years. It will remain a key player in the coming decades, for better or for worse. The job for the United States, NATO, and Russia is to make it for the better. Unlike with the Marshall Plan 50 years ago, Russia today has chosen to participate in the Partnership for Peace. We welcome Russia's participation and hope that over time it will take on a leading role in the partnership commensurate with its importance as a great power. The immediate payoff for our joint training with the partnership nations and our efforts to build a cooperative relationship for Russia has come, ironically, in Bosnia. Up until late last year, to say that the future history of Europe is being written in Bosnia would have been a profoundly pessimistic statement. Today, however, this statement qualifies as guarded optimism, not only because there has been a degree of compliance with the Dayton Peace Agreement, but because of the way I-4 has been put together and because of the way it is performing. I-4, the NATO force in Bosnia, is not a peacekeeping exercise. It is the real thing. Fifteen partner nations have joined the NATO nations in shouldering the responsibility in I-4. A Russian brigade is operating as part of the American division in I-4. The top Russian commander in Bosnia, General Shevstov, visited your Center for Science and International Affairs just last week. Just a few weeks ago, I met with our division commander in Bosnia, along with the Russian brigade commander, and I can report that that operation is going very, very smoothly, with full cooperation between the Russian brigade and the American division commander. NATO itself has a renewed sense of purpose and a sense of its own ability to put together a force for a post-Cold War military mission. This is all positive history, and it shows why I believe that Bosnia is turning out to be the crucible for the creation of Marshall's Europe. Our hopes for democracy and regional understanding and our opportunities to support them through the tools of preventive defense are not, however, simply confined to Europe, although the examples I have given you tonight are all based on Europe. We have these same hopes and opportunities here in our own hemisphere. 
Ten years ago, Latin America was made up mostly of dictatorships, but today, 34 nations in our hemisphere, all nations save one, are democracies. I have tried to seize this opportunity by opening relationships with the defense ministries of these countries. Our efforts came to a climax last summer when I invited the defense ministers from the other 33 hemispheric democracies to join me at Williamsburg, Virginia to discuss confidence-building measures and defense cooperation designed to minimize the risk of conflict in the hemisphere. This con conference was a resounding success, and a second hemispherical minister ministerial meeting has already been scheduled to be held in Argentina this fall. I might mention parenthetically to this audience that the key person in the Defense Department for conceiving and putting together this defense ministerial was your Dean Joe Nye, and he did his country a great service with that effort. Preventive defense also has a role in our effort to manage our relationship with China. We are using some of these same tools to build cooperative security ties between the United States and China. We do this not because China is a new democracy. It is not. Rather, we do it because China is a major world power with whom we share important interests and with whom we have strong disagreements. It has a powerful military that has significant influence on the policies that China follows. We do it ultimately because we believe that when it comes to strategic intentions, engagement is almost always better than ignorance. And that is why we have sent teams to China to present our strategic thinking and have invited the Chinese to reciprocate. It is why we are encouraging exchanges between academic institutions within our military structures. And it is why we have conducted reciprocal ship visits and tours by senior officers. In the best case, Engaging China's military will allow us to have a positive influence on this important player in Chinese politics. And at the very least, engagement between our two military establishments will improve our understanding of each other, thus lowering the chances of a conflict arising as a result of a misunderstanding. What makes preventive defense work, whether it is in Russia, Europe, the Balkans, Latin America, China, is American leadership. There is no other country in the world with the ability to reach out to so many corners of the globe. There is no other country in the world whose efforts to do so are so respected. At the same time, no one should ever think that preventive defense is a philanthropic venture. It is not. Preventive defense involves hard work and ingenuity today so that we do not have to expend blood and treasure tomorrow. While preventive defense holds great promise for preventing conflict, we must appreciate that it is a strategy for influencing the world, not compelling the world to our will. We must frankly and soberly acknowledge the preventive defense will not always work. And that is why, as Secretary of Defense, my top priority has to be maintaining strong and ready forces to deter and defeat threats to our security interests. So we continue to maintain a smaller but still highly effective nuclear arsenal. We are developing a robust threat-based ballistic missile defense. We maintain the best conventional forces in the world, many of which are forward deployed in both Europe and the Asia Pacific. And we continue to maximize our technological advantage over any potential foe to give us dominance on any battlefield in the world. These forces and capabilities, coupled with the political will to use them, allow the United States to be very effective at deterring conflict around the world. These same capabilities and forces mean that if we cannot prevent or deter conflict, we will be able to defeat an aggressor quickly and with a minimum of casualties. But the converse is also true. If we can prevent the conditions for conflict, 
we reduce the risk of having to send our forces into harm's way to deter or defeat aggression. The pivotal role of preventive defense, however, is not widely known to the public. Indeed, it is not even well understood by national security experts. The same was true, of course, about the Marshall Plan in its early days. The Marshall Plan, after all, did not arise full-grown like Venus from the shell. Indeed, George Marshall often maintained that when he gave a speech at Harvard in 1947, he did not present a Marshall Plan. He said instead that it was a proposal, but he did not simply offer his proposal and then go back to Washington. Marshall the statesman was a visionary man, but Marshall the soldier was also a practical man who knew how to plan a campaign. As a practical man, he recognized that in a democracy, no national pro proposal, especially one involving U.S. engagement in the, in the world, becomes a reality unless you can win public support. The Marshall proposal became the Marshall Plan because George Marshall spent the next year going directly to the public and seeking its support. Today, I am presenting not only a proposal for preventive defense, but also a report on how it is already shaping our world in a positive way. But in order for preventive defense to succeed as an approach to national security, we need to convince the American people and the Americans, by nature, are impatient and look for quick fixes to our problems. Sir Michael Howard wisely observed that the last best lesson we have to learn from the Cold War is patience. There are no quick fixes in international politics, no slick military solutions to our political problems. To solve our political problems, our public then needs to support preventive defense. We need to convince America that at this pivotal moment in history, our engagement with the world and the programs supporting preventive defense are critical to our national security. I have chosen the Kennedy School to present my thoughts tonight on preventive defense because as scholars, the students and faculty here are uniquely equipped to understand what is at stake when we talk about preventive defense. As leaders and future policymakers, you are also uniquely equipped to explain the benefits of preventive defense to the American public and to take the concepts, concepts that I've talked about today and expand upon them in your own careers. I urge you to do so. I would like to conclude with my favorite line from Graham Greene. There always comes a moment in time when a door opens and lets the future in. The ending of the Cold War has opened such a door. The future is out there waiting to come in. And by our actions, your actions and my actions, we can shape that future to make a safer world for our children and our grandchildren. Thank you. Secretary Perry will now take questions. There are two microphones on this floor and two on the first balcony. Let me remind you that it's our tradition at the Kennedy School to have one speech per night. You've heard it. <laughs> a question is something short with a question mark at the end, and they come in this setting, one per customer. With those ground rules, I'll turn to this mic. I'm not, I'm not sure you should be quoting uh, Graham Greene in the light of the uh, present administration's policies toward Cuba, um, if you know anything about Graham Greene. Um, 
I'd like to ask you if you wouldn't join me in trying to redefine what we mean when we talk about national security. We have a country that most people now are saying rather explicitly is in deep crisis. We have people who desperately need health care who can't get it. We have people who desperately need housing who can't get it. We have people whose jobs are being eroded. We have people whose real wages are in decline. We have a society. Question. Yeah, I'm, I'm coming. To, yeah, I'm coming to a question. Um, how many seconds do I have? You're finished. Question. Uh huh. Well, so much for democracy, huh? No, there's one speech for each. Well, this isn't a speech. Question. This this is not a speech. This question. is an attempt to frame a question that I think is a very important question. And if you guys are going to get up there and make pronouncements about democracy, you ought to allow someone to have a reason, reasonable chance of framing an intelligible question, okay? My question is, given the fact that we have a $267 billion military budget, don't you think it's time that we made a serious effort to cut back in a, in a more serious way some of the money that's being spent on this enormous military so we can address the extremely important needs of our society that are fundamental to our national security. I'll give a very brief answer to that question. Over the last seven years, we have cut in real, real terms our military budget 41 percent. I consider that a serious effort. Uh, nothing is more fundamental to the security of the nation and having a, a reasonable national defense. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Secretary, earlier in your talk, you mentioned Elie Wiesel, an eloquent spokesman against genocide. And I wanted to ask you about the second largest genocide that's taken place in this century, um, that, that being the proportional terms, the killing of 200,000 people in East Timor by the Indonesians. In particular, I wanted to ask you how you justify the proposed sale of F-16 fighter planes to Indonesia, effectively rewarding the Indonesian military in the face of what the State Department country report says are worsening human rights um, conditions in, in, in East Timor, including extrajudicial killings, disappearances, and torture. Our Indonesia is uh, one of the largest Muslim countries in the world, one of the most influential countries in Asia. They have many things about their policies that we do not like and do not approve. Uh, nevertheless, we believe it is important to engage them, and we believe it is important to in try to do the best we can to influence their actions. Therefore, we have maintained a, a policy of an engagement with Indonesia. Uh, I have I want, want to be very clear that engaging a country with the objective of influencing the policies does not, as I said in my speech, put us in a position to compel the behavior. It is a way of influencing, not a way of compelling. The alternative is to not engage them, to turn our back on them, and nothing in history indicates that that's going to improve their behavior in any respect. Balcony on the left. Uh, thank you for coming here today, Mr. Secretary. I'm a law student, and I was asked a question in international law today, which I was hoping you could answer for me. If, on the one hand, uh, many of your proposals use international law in a very positive way, such as the Non-Proliferation Treaty, Chemical Weapons Convention, and such. On the other hand, some of the proposals to strengthen democracy in different countries might be seen if, as impinging somewhat on their sovereignty to choose their own method of government if there were a situation where some of the countries lapsed back into totalitarianism, would the United States be willing to intervene into those countries to protect democracy, as we have done in Haiti or Bosnia, arguably? Uh, one thing I can say with certainty is I cannot give a general answer to that question. Any time we consider intervening in another country with, mil with military force, we're undertaking a very, very big decision and would only do it when the conditions are such that we believed our vital national security interests were at stake. Uh, 
let me take the example of Bosnia, for example, which is uh, more immediate, more direct. We elected not to intervene militarily in Bosnia for the four years of that civil war. It was only, it was only when we got a peace agreement in Bosnia that we agreed to go in and then as peacekeepers, not as a way of imposing a military settlement on them. So even in a case as extreme as Bosnia, we were not prepared to intervene militarily to impose our will on that country. In general, that will be our answer. Only when there is a, a, a profound belief that our vital national security interests are at stake will we intervene militarily in another country to impose our will on solving their problem. Stop me on the right. Uh, Secretary Perry, one of um, the immediate applications of your preventive uh, defense policy that comes to mind is expanding the role of the UN Security Council to include both Germany and Japan, which I think is, is a common consensus. I want to, number one, ask your opinion on that. And number two, maybe the more thought-provoking question is expanding the role to also include some of the third world countries, including maybe South Africa and Africa, Brazil and Latin America and India in the, in the Asian continent. Uh, determining who the members of the Security Council are is a little bit out of my uh, charter. I do believe that uh, a strong case can be made for Japan and Germany both playing an important enough role in the world today that they stand in uh, equal importance to um, most of the other members of the Security Council. That case has been made, and I think it is a, an appropriate case to be made. What was the second half of that question? The second half of the question was looking at some of the lesser developed countries that are actually power blocks in this specific continent, for example, South Africa in Africa, Brazil in, South, in Latin America, and India in, uh, in the Asian continent, and having those as uh, UN Security Council members as well. I th uh, again, I think that uh, I have discussed this issue both with the Indian and Brazilian leaders in particular, given the size and the importance of both of those countries, the population, uh, the size of their economic development, their uh, importance in national security affairs, I think a case can be made for that. I will not advocate, I will be not making that case today, as I said, that's a little bit out of my charter, but I think it's a perfectly reasonable proposition, and I do believe that over the next uh, three to five years that will receive serious consideration, serious discussion in the United Nations. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I'm from Europe, and we are over there very concerned about microproliferation of nuclear weapons. Um, and I wanted to know whether the U.S. has uh, a concept for preventive defense, preventing terrorists to get uh, nuclear weapons, and whether this is a subject when you discuss uh, with other defense secretaries of uh, other for, uh, former Soviet Union nations. So is this a problem you, take, uh, you try to solve together? Uh, yes, that's a very important discussion. The whole problem of the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction uh, is, by in its generality, is probably the single most important security problem we're dealing with, with, with today. One component of that is keeping them out of the hands of terrorists. I described in some detail one aspect of that program, which is reducing the supply uh, and keeping better controls over the uh, countries that have supply that have political systems in turmoil today. We spend out of our defense budget today about a half a billion dollars a year assisting Russia and Kazakhstan and other countries in, in not only eliminating the nuclear weapons but providing control systems to protect those that are left. Uh, the second aspect of, the, of this problem is working with other nations in the world to prevent the transfer of technology uh, to nations and terrorists that are trying to get either weapons or the uh, fissile material which would allow them to easily build weapons. This was greatly facilitated by changing the technology control system from what used to be called COCOM, the Coordinating Committee, which had been set up to prevent technology, military technology from getting the hands of the uh, former Soviet Union as bloc, to something that's now called Vasanar. And Vasanar is set up to do exactly what you're describing, to try to prevent the technology that would allow uh, nations to develop weapons of mass destruction from getting into their hands. Mr. Secretary, I am a Mexican graduate of this school, 
and also doing now research at, uh, at the program of negotiation. What is your assessment of the Chiapas conflict? Uh, and also, does, uh, is this a case, uh, or is this case a, a, an example, or is this some case that could be used uh, for the purpose of your program uh, of preventive, uh, preventive uh, prevention of conflicts uh, in order to engage the, the Mexican military? I don't consider myself an authority on the subject of the conflict in Chiapas. I have discussed this uh, with the Mexican Minister of Defense and gotten his view uh, of the you know, importance of that problem. Uh, I believe the Mexican government is proceeding uh, very cautiously to try to deal with that problem and have avoided uh, using uh, overreaching with their military forces to try to suppress the uh, that is they're trying to resolve the problem uh, through dialogue and peaceably rather than through military power I believe that is the right approach for them to take but I say again I do not consider myself an authority on the issues there and the ways of dealing with it uh, Mr. Secretary, I, I am just a little confused in your speech. You spoke about trying to support democracy in various nations, these little statelets, some of them postage stamp republics around the world. And can you explain to me what you mean by democracy when, for example, our military intervention into Croatia and Bosnia last uh, August and September sparked the ethnic cleansing of 450,000 Serbians from their centuries-old homes when we violated Bosnia's former constitution, which required the uh, approval of all three ethnic groups to secede from former Yugoslavia, and in fact today, when the Bosnian Muslims only comprise 43% of Bosnia's population and the rest, the Bosnian Croats and the Bosnian Serbs, 57% overwhelmingly want out of a Muslim-dominated state. So can you please explain how, what your perception of democracy is for these Balkan peoples who are in the midst of yes. this tragic civil yes, conflict? Yes, I can explain. I'd be happy to. Uh, we have our peacekeeping forces in Bosnia today pursuant to to enforcing a, a compliance of an agreement which was freely reached by the parties in Bosnia, including the Bosnian Serbs and including Serbia. This is an agreement which they freely signed and we are there to help uh, enforce compliance with. That's what I mean by democracy. Oh, good evening, Mr. Secretary. The question goes, it's about, similar to your topic, which is about past, present, and future. It's about revolutionary times, which are we are in right now, but to remind us about the past, a similar time when Rome has defeated Greece, and the times was open for a free kill of local small mini-states. As Secretary of Defense, it is your moral obligation to be very careful which directions our country leads, because as well as we, the Romans spoke as defense, but they only act as offense. That's the question. I didn't understand the question. There is no question mark. Oh. Uh, the question Are is... Are we in danger of repeating Rome's behavior towards small states such as Greece? No. <laughs> Mr. Secretary, my name is Chris Teeson. I'm a sophomore in the college and a member of the Student Advisory Committee of the Institute of Politics. My question for you tonight is what role do you see for ballistic missile defense and the typology of Star Wars, X-ray laser brilliant, eyes brilliant, pebbles approach in the national defense and what timeline do you see for such? Uh, I'll try to give a compressed answer to that question, but I hope you appreciate the complex issue that you raised. There are three threats or potential threats of ballistic missiles, which we regard today, and each one of them there's a different answer. First, here there is here and now a threat from SCUD missiles. Over 30 different nations have SCUD missiles. Uh, several of them have used them in anger in wars already, so they represent a real and present danger to our troops. We have a system in the field today called the Patriot, which is designed, which has been adapted to operate against that. In my opinion, this system is not good enough to deal with the threat. 
We are therefore developing an improved system, in fact, two approved systems, one called Patriot 3 and the other is an improved Aegis system which will operate from a ship. Those systems will be deployed in 1999 and give our forces in the field a better potential to defend themselves. That's one component of our ballistic missile defense program. Secondly, some of these nations that have SCUDs are either developing or trying to buy greatly improved uh, theater ballistic missiles, uh, the most uh, infamous of which is the so-called Nodong missile in North Korea. Uh, this has longer range, higher speed, is more difficult to defend against. And so we are developing a two different systems to defend against that threat when it becomes an important problem. And one of these systems is called THADS, the Theater High Altitude Air Defense System. The other is called Navy Upper Tier System, a wide area defense system. Uh, we have a development program underway for those two systems. They will be ready for deployment sometimes early in the next decade. And finally, uh, <clears throat> there is the potential threat from longer range ICBMs, intercontinental missiles, against the United States. Uh, besides the threat which has existed for decades uh, in the Soviet Union and China, for which we are, have for decades defended ourselves through deterrence, there is the danger that uh, rogue nations might uh, in sometime in the future develop ICBMs, and they may not be deterred uh, the same way that Soviet Union used to be and presumably Russia is today. Therefore, we have a, de uh, a development program to develop a national missile defense system, one that would have in no way be capable of performing what the old SDI system. SDI system, Strategic Defense Initiative, was designed to operate against a massive attack against the United States, thousands of warheads. That took a very complex and expensive system in fact, the technical feasibility isn't, was then and still is in some question. This is a much easier problem to defend against a rogue nation that has maybe a dozen uh, warheads directed against the United States. It's technically quite feasible, and we are developing that system. It will be ready for a deployment decision in about three years. Uh, if three years from now, when the development is complete, we decide the threat is imminent enough that it's worth producing and deploy it, we could do that in another three years after that. So we could have such a system deployed if we want to deploy it by the year about 2003. Uh, that is quite likely sooner than such a threat would be developed against the United States, but our plans uh, would be prepared for that contingency. I'm sorry for the long answer, but it's a complicated question. Uh Good afternoon, Mr. Secretary. Uh, my name is Whitfield Larrabee. I'm a lawyer uh, here in Boston. Uh, you indicated that a principle of uh, U.S. leadership is that fewer uh, weapons of mass destruction and fewer hands makes the world a safer place. And uh, the 100 million uh, landmines planted throughout the world uh, are certainly weapons of mass destruction which have killed uh, more uh, people than nuclear, chemical, and bacteriological weapons combined. Uh, that's 23,000 civilians uh, last year. Uh, my question is, why, how does the Pentagon justify firing Timothy Connolly uh, just recently, an outspoken opponent within the Pentagon, for the abolition of these uh, inhuman and indiscriminate killers, which Norman Schwarzkopf has described as unnecessary? And uh, why is the U.S. military uh, dragging its feet on banning these weapons? Uh, you have been the victim of disinformation. First of all, the firing of Connolly had nothing to do, absolutely nothing to do with the uh, landmine problem. Secondly, he was an outspoken opponent, coincidentally, though. Yet his firing had nothing to do with being an outspoken opponent of landmines. I am an outspoken opponent of anti personnel landmines, and I will make very substantial efforts to move the United States in the position of getting rid of anti-personnel landmines. Thank you. We'd the, appreciate uh, that. I want to clarify one point, though. While I appreciate and have very deep concern with the carnage that's being done every year with anti-personnel landmines out there, I also have some responsibility for the 
commitments the United States has made, for example, to the defense of Korea. Without giving you any details of our contingency war plan in Korea, I will tell you that it involves a substantial use of anti-tank and anti-personnel landmines, that without those, we will not be able to defend Seoul. And therefore, if we were to get in a war in North Korea, if we were to, say, eliminate all the landmines that are now deployed in Korea, and a war were to start there, it would uh, mean the deaths of tens of thousands of American soldiers and hundreds of thousands of civilians, because we would have to retreat south of Seoul before we were able to go back and finally recapture it. Well, sir, that is an important problem, too, and I have to weigh both of those problems. Yet Therefore, Korea only any, spends $2 billion. Any policy, and we say, and any policy which North we will advance, we will take that South into Korea account. Spends five, Pardon? Uh, North Korea only spends $2 billion or $3 billion on its defense, whereas South Korea spends far more. And we, they have North, uh, North Korea has 1.1 million men under arms located within 60 miles of the DMZ. And if they send those 1.1 million men south, they will, they will, there will be carnage. Believe me, I have no doubt about what I'm telling you here. And therefore, if we they have did to, that, I we have to have that, that problem dealt with. But let me get back to the fundamental point. Anti-personnel landmines are an abomination, and we must find a way of getting rid of them. Copy. Good evening, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Secretary um, my, my question is to some degree similar to the previous one, but it is how, how can the United States, while, while urging control of weapons of mass destruction among other nations, continue to expand its share of the conventional, conventional weapons market around the world, even to states which are on the verge of internal conflict or in the transitional stage to democracy? Does this practice not reflect a motivation fueled by greed and self-interest rather than by sound foreign policy and a mutual achievement of peace. How, how can we justify expanding our share of the conventional arms market? I don't and I wouldn't. But it is. Good evening, sir. Um, traditionally, the existence of American military bases abroad have been mutually beneficial. The United States has been able to exercise its influence in, for example, European security matters, and in return, Europe has received substantial protection. Um, about two weeks ago, CNN ran an article that said that Germany would be permitted to establish 60 of their best fighters, the Tornado plane, in um, New Mexico. I wanted to know, first, if this were true, second, why this is being allowed, and third, how in any way is that mutually beneficial? for the United States? Yes, uh, Germany is, uh, we've made an agreement with Germany to allow the basing and the uh, testing of 60 of their Tornado fighters at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. This is the uh, one base in the United States which Germany uses. Uh, over the years, we have had hundreds of thousands of American soldiers and uh, at dozens of, of uh, army bases, air bases and naval bases in Germany. The, I think this is arrangement is a classic win-win-win. That is, it's a win for the German Air Force because they have the opportunity to train in a climate that is much more congenial to training than in the center of Germany. It's a win for the U.S. Air Force because they get uh, substantially improved facilities at that air base as a result of this joint effort. And I went to Holloman with the German defense minister last week and met with the citizens of Almogordo, which is the nearest community to Holloman Air Force Base. And as far as they're concerned, it is a win for them. They are very happy to have the uh, German soldiers. Uh, airmen and families located in their community. Um, good evening, Mr. Secretary. I enjoyed your speech. Um, my question, I have 
two questions. The first is, in regards to the, to the continent of Africa, you spoke tonight about the Marshall Plan. I'm wondering, because the only information I have is reading the paper, it seems to me that there's sort of a, a negligible or a um, hopscotch kind of approach to dealing with the continent of Africa. I'm wondering if someone, um, is there going to be a consideration in terms of policy of changing that attitude? Um, or is it, you know, having someone, um, having a group just deal with the continent of Africa? I'm concerned because the policy seems to be sort of um, negligible, it's not consistent. I would not say that uh, uh, our interest and in our efforts applied to Africa have been negligible. They're not, certainly not comparable to what we do in Europe, or for that matter, in Asia, uh, because our economic interests and our political interests are not comparable. But we have very real interests in Africa. As we, as we stand here and speak, uh, the President's National Security Advisor is in Burundi uh, meeting with the Burundi political leaders, seeing if he can find some way to try to ameliorate what looks to be a, a, a very dangerous a civil war that may break out in that country. Now, we are trying to find ways of ameliorating the conflict in Liberia, so far without success. Now, we have put considerable resources at an earlier date into Rwanda, too late to stop the civil war, but in time to prevent a uh, what would have been a really catastrophic uh, outbreak of cholera in that country. We are working with South Africa and with some of the neighboring countries to try to develop uh, security and political relationships in that part of Africa. So what we are doing in Africa is in no way comparable to what's going on, I agree, in Europe or in Asia, but it's not negligible either. I apologize. I didn't. Uh, negligible was too harsh a term. Yeah. Inconsistent would be more appropriate. I apologize. We're unfortunately at the. Uh, we passed our hour and a half time mark, but uh, I wanted to say that uh, we're very grateful to Secretary Perry for his patience with our questions, but also for his uh, provoking thoughts about preventive defense. And I think the job that he leaves behind is not merely to thank him tonight for such a good speech, but to ask ourselves, how do we go about implementing that first line of defense? And it's something that we'll want to turn our thoughts to. So thank you very much for a very interesting evening. Thank you.